Hi everyone and welcome to the Imagining a New We video blog with me, Dr. Samantha Cotrera, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. We're continuing our amazing series today on pandemic pedagogy, thinking about um, history and teaching history and community and collaboration related to history, um, both during this moment and after this moment. And it's been so amazing to be able to talk to so many different people in this field, and today is no exception. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Jeffrey Ryu. Jeffrey is a professor at uh, York University. He is a historian in the field of critical disability studies. Critical disability studies is a field of study that really challenges what we in society understand to be uh, illness, what we understand to be disability, what we understand to be normal. Um, he teaches uh, disability history, for example, at York University, but he's also a public historian. He has been an activist in his public history work for over 20 years right now. Uh, his particular focus is on uh, psychiatric history and people that have been diagnosed with psychiatric illnesses. And so a lot of his work is on mad people's history, this notion of um, madness to really challenge what that looks like. I got to know Jeffrey gosh, about 10, 15 years ago in doing a history project or doing a edu history education project related to bringing notions of mad people's history into classrooms. And it was such a transformative moment for me to be able to think in different ways because of this field. So I hope that you enjoy this talk as much as I have enjoyed learning about critical disability studies and the critical disability history field. So let's go over to Jeffrey. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Hi. I am uh, I'm so excited Welcome. for you to be able to bring your perspectives of being a historian in the field of critical disability studies to this conversation. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. I look forward to participating. I'm glad you're running this series as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's been really great the people's responses, and uh, I can um, I can imagine that this conversation will be no less amazing. So um, let's start with our first question, and um, in the first question, maybe we can kind of segue into an introduction about critical disability studies and what it's like to be a historian in this field. So the first question I ask people is if they think about history any differently because of this moment, because I have, um, not everyone has kind of shifted and changed, but I, I think that there's so much room here to think about so many things about history differently. Have you thought about history any differently in this, this moment? And how does, your, how does your perspective of being a historian in the field of critical disability studies shape that? Well, yes, I have um, in some ways, uh, because it's been such an astonishing um, few weeks, hasn't it? It's been quite astonishing. March was, I, I don't think I have ever seen a month with such colossal changes all over the world so quickly and so catastrophically. I mean, millions of people lost their jobs in the matter of a few weeks. It's just in Canada and all over the world. And um, so many people... Uh, having to be quarantined on a scale we've never seen before in mm. the entire world. So um, it's it's stunning. All of this, I think, makes you realize history is not just the past, it's what's going on right now. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are experiencing what disabled people have experienced on an individual level in their own, in, in their own communities um, <clears throat> throughout um, modern history uh, is now being experienced by a lot of people who don't consider themselves disabled. Um, so it's it's in some ways it's it's in a mass experience of disablement. <laughs> mm. um, a lot of people take of taking for granted things that uh, you can walk down the street, for example. And of course, not all disabled people can walk, um, and or, or get out. Basically, it's some people can. Uh, most people think most of us took for granted just going to the park or going out for to the uh, cafe or, or what have you. Um, and of course, that's no longer uh, so possible anymore, the social distancing. Many disabled people, um, even if they could get out, often couldn't get into the cafe because it's not accessible. So a lot of things that, uh, that uh, aren't accessible to the vast majority of people now, uh, in many cases, haven't been accessible to disabled people. 
uh, in the past and in, in, in the present as well. So, in, in other words, there's a mass vulnerability that lots of disabled people experience all the time. And I think that's something that, as a historian, I think um, that's worth reflecting upon. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting, and I, I and and I think really powerful. And maybe this moment is a way, or maybe we can help understand history in this moment by being challenged by the work of of critical uh, critical disability studies uh, scholars, historians, as a way to understand the historicity of isolation and access and vulnerability that um, disabled people have always faced as a way to understand how we can challenge this notion of, of what, it, what it means to be disabled in society in a way that can bring, uh, um, a bring greater understanding to what it's like with these, kind, with these societal and economic vulnerabilities. Yes, very much so. And, and that uh, the, the fact that so many people are also being scapegoated as the other, so yeah. to speak. Yes. Of course, we know that the xenophobia that has, that has happened, particularly towards people of East Asian descent and uh, people who are Chinese, but uh, particularly, um, and the racism that has, has occurred um, and being scapegoated and uh, or, or being uh, people being seen as a burden in other contexts. Disabled mm. people have been historically been categorized as a burden. Um, and we've seen great concerns from the disability community generally uh, about being seen as a um, potentially not as worth having um, life-saving um, supports in a medical emergency if they have COVID-19. Will they get a respirator or will a disabled person get a respirator or not depending on the, um, the nature of their disability and the healthcare worker's attitude towards that person with disability. Um, there's been pushback, a lot of disabled activists and allies have uh, uh, critiqued a lot of these ideas. There was an ideas around <clears throat> um, deciding who could or couldn't get um, uh, certain kinds of, of healthcare treatment if they had COVID-19. And a lot of activists uh, critiqued this and wrote to the federal and provincial governments and federal and provincial governments and, uh, around <clears throat> early to mid-April um, responded, uh, of course, that they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't not prioritize prioritize disabled people. So the, the government, gov at least here in Canada, some of the governments have come out and said that they will make sure disabled people aren't left by the wayside. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's an important um, change in that sense uh, from some of the previous draft policies that were being circulated. Well, this notion too of xenophobia, like I think, and this is something that's come up in a lot of the videos that this moment has really like unearthed these structures that work or don't work. Most of the time they don't work. And this notion of xenophobia, I think also, you know, it's identifying who we understand to be people in our country, to be a people in our nation as kind of worthy for treatment, right? Because that to me um, really highlights the fact that uh, people can be like, well, if I don't have a disabled person in my family, like, those people, those people can get sick, whereas I want to protect my own. And this notion of my own and others can be so much more broad because this moment is like unearthing uh, these structures that we, we wouldn't have articulated that before, but now we are. And I think what I'm hearing from you is the importance well i mean what i'm i'm gathering because i know that of your work in historian the importance of using history to be able to challenge that but also to rally with activists to to force change um in those those ideas even if we haven't articulated them yes that's right so the um the whole issue of scapegoating the other it's it's mm. i mean you can go back to the middle ages jews were uh, blamed uh, quote unquote blamed for um uh, causing uh, the Black Death in 1348 to 51 uh, in medieval Europe during the Black Death of bubonic plague, which killed a third to one third to a half of the population of Western Europe um, at that time, and where some Jews were burned at the stake. Um, and so we know this this prejudice, bigoted attitude goes back a long time, and it's literally cost people their lives who have been othered. 
Um, and of course, we know about the anti-Asian immigrant attitude that has a long history as well. It's it's certainly well before this period. There were different examples of um, of contagious disease outbreaks in and yeah. different parts of North America. And for example, um, in Calgary in 1892, uh, and um, in um, Chinatown in San Francisco as well in the late 19th century where uh, Chinese people were scapegoated and um, in some cases even attacked. Um, and, um, the, so the, these racist prejudices come up again and again. Um, and of course, disabled people are um, very much been uh, part of that and being scapegoated uh, based very much on the eugenic ideas that disabled people don't aren't as productive, quote unquote, mm -hmm. as other people. So whole idea of notions of who is productive and who isn't, who is as worthwhile a citizen and who isn't um, is uh, is something that factors into all of these uh, all of these prejudices and of course um, are often based on completely inaccurate ideas as well. Disabled people can be as productive as anyone else, but also what notions of productivity we have to be careful. Even someone who is who is not considered productive in the typical um, economic sense under a capitalist system has as every bit as worthwhile a contribution and place in society as someone who doesn't. You don't have to be someone who writes articles or sits in an office or who works in a factory to be a worthwhile person. And obviously it's it, it's very important to emphasize that we should not have um, economic factors as the ultimate litmus test of whether somebody belongs in society and is, is worthwhile contributors to society. Well. I think about what you're saying too about uncertainty because even when this is over, whatever that looks like, it won't be over for so many people <laughs> because because this moment will stay with us and um, uh, and if, for example, someone couldn't get physiotherapy during this time, they they might not be able to interact in society the way that they would have with consistent care, but also things like anxieties and mental health issues that are going to going to be a result or be exacerbated by things like the vulnerability, the uncertainty, the the lack of access, the uh, the, the social isolation, um, and so to me, I think about. Uh, I think about students and I think about classrooms and I think about how this will impact how and in what ways that we will teach history after this moment. Do you think the way we will teach history will change after this moment? Do you think that the, the notion of vulnerability that we are all feeling right now to, to various degrees, um, definitely not equally, um, do you think this notion of vulnerability will shift the way that we teach history? Do you think it should? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I mean, I I don't have a, a, a definite answer. I mean, of course, obviously, one practical sense, it's taint changing for everybody teaching um, by being on, on remote distance teaching. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how we conceptualize what we're teaching is, is very important. And the whole issue of people's experiencing of um, mental health um, stress and anxiety hugely important that people are experiencing right now uh, mm -hmm. and will be experiencing um, long into the future and it will only uh, increase as uh, as the uncertainty increases so um, the supports that we uh, have for our um, students and uh, as well as uh, faculty and staff who are engaged in all of this uh, effort to teach differently is, is um, something that we have to think about and and try to uh, um, do as equitably as possible. I think part of it is that uh, we're going to have to um, understand if, if we're going to be doing more remote teaching as a result of, of this pandemic, um, we need to uh, basically uh, make far greater accommodations for our students and, by the way, for faculty as well, in the way we teach this. Um, it can't be just the standard um, teaching process that, at York University, for example, we have a standard three-hour class. I know it's different at different universities, 
Um, and I think that for a lot of people, they, they won't be able to, to do that. They have childcare for one thing, yeah. people have, or elder care, taking care of loved ones or taking care of oneself. When does uh, people, um, whether they have COVID-19 or, or, or any other health condition, if you're at home, you're gonna, it's not as easy to, to separate the classroom from home now, is it? Because no. we're, it's right there. <laughs> and, um, and so how we teach it is, I think, a way of, of trying to bring history into the home um, mm. and uh, talking about how um, we think about um, the fact that this remote teaching is being done to a greater extent than ever before for obvious reasons because of the emergency, pan emergency pandemic. But um, what happened in the past in the um, in the uh, uh, flu pandemic, 1918 to 1920, um, which was a worldwide catastrophe, as we all know, um, they didn't have remote teaching, obviously. Um, schools were, no, their internet access was so poor then. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, I don't know. Can't, can't understand why. <laughs> they didn't have, they didn't have what we have, obviously. Um, and, uh, and so the schools just closed. They have done something at home if they had the resources, but you could certainly have seen how in, in the flu pandemic of a hundred years ago, people would have lost uh, all that period of education that they could, uh, children would have lost because their parents were busy. busy uh, if they did have work, if they were able to go to work, of course, um, trying to survive or just didn't have the skills to teach uh, child children or were too busy with, you know, seven or eight or ten children because the families generally tend to be bigger than, um, than now. So we have to remember that um, that when we think of, of of what we're trying to do as teachers, now we have, can try to think of how people cope with past pandemics in, in the family unit um, or in extended families or in communities. Oh, but it is still, um, it's still figuring out things as we go along. And so I think it's a, a a learning curve as we go uh, how to teach more effectively and how to engage students and we have to figure out how to, to change and to adapt and to try to make this work in a better way for everyone and so that's something um, so that's something i think uh, we all need to figure out including myself so I'm, i don't have an answer basically my answer is i don't know <laughs> i'm trying to figure it out as we go on and i'll continue to and uh, as, as so many others are and i'm reading stuff online about more pedagogically better ways of teaching online as well as we do this so it's a, it's a question mark for me right now. i mean i think i think that's i think it's so valid i think it's a question mark for so many of us and because it happens so quickly and so many of us mm -hmm. care so much for our students that we like i think there was just this expectation in, in all of our individual heads that we needed to make it perfect right away and mm -hmm. um and like seamless and of course that that, that, that was never going to be the case. Um, no. And for me, I think about what you are saying, what you said earlier about vulnerability. Like, we could start by teaching history from this place of vulnerability to say, what's going on? Let's figure out. Let's figure out how this is the same and different from moments in the past and how they dealt with it to learn about like quarantine suits, you know, um, and how they worked or how they didn't work. Um, I think starting from a place of vulnerability can make us all better educators, but I think also is more honest to the moment because, yeah, whether or not we know the technology or not, um, I, I think we all can agree that teaching is about this relationship between teacher and student in a, in a way that um, brings out the best in, in what a student could learn from the information that the professor has and feels is important to share at that moment. Yes, that's right. I think, and that's a very important point about the, our own vulnerabilities as teachers and um, the students' vulnerabilities um, who are undergoing so much stress in their daily lives. Um, and uh, being online a lot, glaring into a computer can be itself stressful. Yeah. Um, and, and so we have to uh, take account of that as well um, and interacting a lot on on platforms where we haven't previously been most of us haven't previously been so used to so um so all of these are, are things we all need to take into account as we deal with COVID-19 I think as a historian looking back at the 
um, histories of disabled people and the experiences of, of, of mad people in particular. I teach a lot of courses on um, and to say the history of disability, people with disabilities and, and mad people's history, as well as history of healthcare ethics. Um, these, the, all of these uh, anxieties that people are experiencing now on a, on a mass scale is, is something that I think um, we need to place in the, the context of how many people have endured this in their um, individual lives um, in, in these different histories um, that are go ongoing right now and that uh, we're all living out in our, our daily lives in various various ways um, so it's it's something we're all trying to figure out as we go through this monumental change in everyone's life right well and well i think about what you said earlier about um about how this moment is highlighting things that disabled people have faced for so long, things like access, isolation, and vulnerability, because those things we can start our teaching from that moment to ensure that our students are able to access materials in a, in a different, in different ways. And so not just, mm -hmm. but like I, I teach a small class right now and I, even though all the students attend, they still record it so that they can watch it later. and. Um, do email summaries so that they can access it differently, that we still run a class so that they don't feel isolated even when or especially when they don't feel like they're going to be successful in the course anymore, but just to stay connected and to start from that place for, from, for vulnerability to start, we do a check-in every class just to be like, how you feeling? I know this is weird, you know, because um, I, I think mm. there's things how you how you started by talking about the elements we can take from critical disability histories can really help our teaching. So, uh, so I just melded them together. But like, thank you for that because I don't think we all have answers, and using some of these histories to guide us can can really help. I yeah. think. Yes, I think that's that's very true around uh, issues of, of feeling like you're a full citizen, for example. Right. Lots of disabled people have not been made to feel a full citizen as well. There's a book uh, by a disability studies scholar at the University of Victoria, um, Michael Prince, uh, called Absent Citizens, and he talks about how disabled people have, have been um, excluded from citizenship very so very often, and, and, are, and he's specifically referring to Canadian context, but it's it's very true. I mean, um, part of it is is uh, I, I think what you're pointing out is is feeling um, whether you feel you're going to be um, as you say uh, feeling part of the course basically is right. or part or part part of you really feel as much part of the course if you're just online and, and not in the classroom um, or how to what extent can you, some people may feel a better able to engage online on the other hand. Too. other that's people right, may feel right. less like some people may feel more comfortable engaging in the classroom than online so um, so it's uh, all of these things are are, um, are, are diff out differently in different contexts and so that comes up brings all sorts of issues about disabled people engaging in research um, who often have uh, these barriers that they experience in their day-to-day -day lives that uh, are now being experienced by large numbers of people as never before. Um, and so that, again, that brings back, um, disablement is being experienced in different contexts uh, and different ways, but uh, there's large scale disablement, I think as, as never before. It's not equal, and I'm not saying it's the same for everyone, it's not, uh, for all sorts of reasons around class, race, gender, um, and um, ability. Uh, but, um, but nevertheless, there is a huge amount of, uh, of, of, uh, of vulnerability. I keep coming back to that word that people yeah. have, haven't experienced. I mean, I would come back to that word too. And this notion of disablement, yes, it's, it's in no way equal, but it can be this opening to be able to help us think about things differently, about history differently, mm -hmm. differently but also, uh, also our society differently. So this leads to the last question, just a, a quick call. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about a lot of these things um, already, but the, the idea of this, this video series, it's called Imagining a New We, because I found in history classes, 
specifically K to 12 history classes, there can be this like uh, a way to 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 underlie this us versus them mentality. And so the idea of the video blog generally was to to challenge that. How can we challenge this notion of us versus them? How can we think more creatively and collaboratively about a we together? Um, and so as a way to end, uh, can you comment at all? Do you think the ways that we can or should imagine a different, more inclusive, less othered we will shift and change after this moment? Yeah, I, well, I would hope that uh, at the most basic level, more people will understand the need for accommodations. That's been a challenge for many disabled students and faculty and staff who've requested accommodation and um, somewhere along the chain of command, so to speak, whether it be a professor who is responding to a student or an administrator who is responding to a higher level administrator who's responding to a faculty member or a staff, uh, is is not as sympathetic. Um, in many cases, they are. I'm not saying that's the case always. Of course, it's not always the case. There are many people who are supportive, but there are many cases where um, you will hear of where there's the attitudinal barrier is still there. Um, yeah. That impacts people in other ways as well. Of course, um, that oh no, um, they they should just. Uh, uh, take the uh, do the course uh, on there they, they, if we give them accommodation they will have special privileges quote unquote compared to somebody else um, who doesn't have the uh, the accommodation and of course it that often completely ignores the fact that some people for example require more time to get their work done um, for very legitimate reasons related to their disabilities uh, physical disabilities um, uh, uh, mental health disabilities um, and uh, cognitive disabilities as well, um, and uh, or sensory disabilities, um, as well as the fact that uh, people, of course, have all sorts of, uh, of things going on in their lives that require that re require extra time. Um, that uh, is very important. Uh, Childcare being one, obviously, uh, work schedules. So um, I, I, I would, uh, or elder care as well. This is, um, very important. So I, all of this brings back to the point, I think that I would hope that there would be more uh, understanding of accommodation mm. for large numbers of people. And, and that includes, by the way, people who can't um, uh, do distance learning. Well, too, like even, even the word accommodation insinuates there's a, a normal standard that everyone should be yeah. up to, right? That you are now being exactly. accommodated, something's being accommodated. And I think that this can help us push what we consider normal um, in a way mm -hmm. to be more inclusive about what that might look like for all of us moving forward. Um, you brought up so many really, really interesting elements to this conversation. I want to thank you so much. This has been really, really awesome. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, will you be able to share with us some links and things like that if people wanted to uh, engage in some activism and be an ally or be an activist in this field um, to, to help support that? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll forward some to you. In, in very shortly and let okay, you know where, what people, where people can look, particularly around uh, COVID-19, but also more generally too. So that would be very good. I'm glad to do that. And, and thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. Oh, it's been so amazing. And by the time everyone is watching this, those links will be below the video so you can check those out. Um, okay. And yeah, thank you again. I, um, uh, like I said, I really think that it, uh, helps develop this conversation out and um, thank you for bringing your perspectives and your experience and your expertise to this conversation. You're welcome. Thanks again for asking me. All the best. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.